So the highlights for me and things that I think lessons learned that we're doing really well is that we are part of the Bob Marshall complex. It's not Spotted Bear alone doing what Spotted Bear does. When we get a fire, we work very strong. Our line officer group within the Bob Marshall complex, our fire managers within the Bob Marshall complex, our wilderness managers, we have a charter. Most of the folks probably don't know what the charter even says anymore, but we meet a couple times, up to three times formally each year, you know, with all the managers together, all the rangers. Historically, we had the forest supervisors involved. Over time, there's been less engagement with our forest supervisors, but they still encourage and support us to keep the Bob Marshall complex as a whole going. And what I think is key about that is um, when we have that fire that's near or has the potential to be going and impacting um, moving on to Rocky Mountain District, I'm calling Mike. Um, a good chance that somebody's called Kyle or Russ. Um, if it's something that, and, and actually in my tenure I have to say we've gotten more fires from Rocky Mountain District to Spotted Bear District than we've actually given Rocky Mountain. But we have that dialogue constantly. Same with Sealy Lake. We've given a lot of fires and shared some of the fire ecology on the landscape to Sealy Lake. They in turn have shared some fires and stuff back to Spotted Bear. But that dialogue between us all is really positive. And it's helping us, well, if we're not going to make the same decisions with fire restrictions, for example, why aren't we making the same decisions? Last year's a great example. We had very dry conditions on the west side of the Continental Divide and very moist conditions on the east side of the Continental Divide. And up until last year, we'd always been the same when we put in fire restrictions. Because when you're out there in a social context and recreating, you don't really know what ranger district you're on. You know, and so we strive to be consistent with interpreting our rules and how to make that work. And so we used the Continental Divide last year and the Rocky Mountain District and Lincoln didn't have the same things going on that Sealy Lake and Spotted Bear and then um, Hungry Horse had. So we work to have that consistency and I think that's one of the things that really works well. That dialogue's ongoing, that communication, that coordination. And, and then that leads to us sharing resources and, and whatnot. And then the other part of it for me is it's not just about our fire program. It's about our integrated wilderness and fire and all our resources and sharing it. And on this ranger district, everybody's engaged in the fire program in the sense that all of our folks, whether you're coming as an SCA intern or you're involved and on a trail crew or a weed crew, you're going to a guard school. You're getting the basics about fire management and how you're going to be out there. And if it's not something that you can be qualified to be on the line, you're going to be engaged in, in logistics support, planning support. You might be a driver, but you're going to have a role helping with fire. Vice versa, our fire crew is going to have a role helping with our stock program. They're going to be helping feed. They're going to be learning to use stock. They're going to be engaged in what the weed program does. But it's integrated. And so if I had something to share for the forest and the region and nationally, and where it leads, this is leading to a big challenge I see ahead of us, is the direction that we come down from us, it's still very resource functional when it comes to us. You know, it's here's our fuels, here's this. But when it comes to on the ground, we have to have it integrated. And so we have to be able to be thinking not only about the science and the ecology part, but the social part and the wilderness users out there and the experience. And what are we doing to the once in the lifetime folks that have made this fabulous trip with the outfitters and, and you know, they can't rearrange their schedule to put it on hold, but all of a sudden, if that outfitted trip gets to experience what that fire is doing on the landscape and seeing it, they just added tenfold what their experience might have been. So the more that we can keep areas open and accessible when we have fires going on. And so that's why last year's decision for me when we ended up shutting down the wilderness for a time period, it was gut-wrenching. It just literally tore me apart to say, you know, we no longer have the staff to be able to meet and greet and get folks rerouted because we were rerouting folks every day. And you know, you're, when you're asking, so we talked to the folks that just hiked in and out on the field trip. So think about you guys that hiked in 12 miles in a day and we're rerouting folks saying, sorry, you can't come to Black Bear for you to get out to the trailhead. You're going to have to hike another extra 25 miles. 
We're rerouting them so they are short of food. Well, think about all our regulations of you can't help them with food. You can't help them with extra sleeping <coughs> stuff. What are we going to do? We're going to step forward and say, you know, our, we're the forest service. We are supposed to help provide service. We are help to help them while well, their cars are down at Lodgepole. They're coming out Meadow Creek or their cars were at Meadow Creek. Well, we just evacuated 25 vehicles at Meadow Creek because, and none of their vehicles got um, impacted, but we needed to move them out. So making, finding all those people in this vast wilderness and where their keys might be, and as they get bumped around, helping them drive vehicles and that. Is that something you know you think we're supposed to do? I think it is. And we need to do it carefully, and then you got all this risk of what if you had an accident with somebody's vehicle or that. So we had outfitters step up and help shuttle people from the Smith Creek Trailhead to Spotted Bear. What a drive for people to do. So thinking about what we all need to do, having it more integrated, um, I think is really important. I think that it's really okay and it's a challenge when you have that fire and you have multiple fires going on. Um, last year we put together a great long-term plan, um, presented it jointly with Chip Weber and Bill Avey, had the region on board, and that fire, you know, maybe what four or five acres went on to Rocky Mountain District last summer, stayed very small, contained on Spotted Bear. It wasn't one that grew, did anything, but we did a great long-term plan for it. It was our first early um, fire. But I wonder and worry about, as we've had leadership change in the region, and even nationally, so we have take off the fire part of this, and maybe this is not politically correct, but um, it's okay, I'm at the end of the career path, and so um, careful where you put on what video. Um, yeah, got to think about this. So nationally, we're being told there's not a, a drive to continue to have a lot of folks interested in wilderness. And so we're going to pull a lot of the money coming away from wilderness and trails, and we're going to put it in the front country to better serve the public. Well, we do have a strong user component out there that really does value wilderness. And if we don't think about how to keep our trails open and how to, um, we've been charged and we have a great sense of pride of leading and having a national mod model for stewardship in wilderness management, having trails that are to standard, having um, wilderness being managed to standard, we're at risk in the future right now. And part of that is because we are implementing a successful fire program. But we are at risk in the future of not having trails opened, not being able to do the monitoring, not being able to do that, because we're going to take a lot of funds away from wilderness. And in past directors and cooperatively, we had support from regional directors and even national and, and some on force, but, but at the district level it's integrated and we share and think about how we can best use the, the limited resources we have. <coughs> and so if if Dave Bunnell actually gave us $2 million and we couldn't use it all on fire, but maybe we took 50,000 of it or 80,000 of it and dealt with the extra blowdown on those trails, we used to be able to compete for extra money because we had had the fires. And, and anywhere from that, from that first year to year 15, you see a lot of additional downfall and, and stuff coming down. Well, you got a lot of pride in those primitive skills and using the cross cuts and the axes. And then there's others saying, well, it's time to go to chainsaws. Well, <coughs> we're back in wilderness, guys, and we need to remember putting the whole package together. So that's my plea is in the future, I think the fire decisions, they're gut-wrenching. But let me tell you, it's even harder because there's a movement of with Bear Creek fire, we're going to get, we had 125 miles of trail impacted with fire activity on it last year. And that's part of having fire, and I welcome that. But we also then need a means to make sure we're going to have trail access in the future. The other answer is, well, this is a good time for you to get rid of some of your extra trail miles that you don't need. And I don't think that's acceptable. So that's my challenge is how do we continue to find some funds to support us because the burned area emergency funds, they're changing the rules on what kind of things can be applied for, for trails. There's a lot more opportunities for your roads and bridges and your front country things, but your back country opportunities are being decreased um, as the leadership has changed at the national level um, for what's allowed it with your burned area emergency response 
the post fire in the black dollars that we've gotten over the years, very limited to compete and have those. So if you guys were looking at what are the big issues facing us in the future, it's not going to be because we don't know the science of fire. It's because we can't be able to give the social side of it how they're going to be able to access and, and experience wilderness in the future if we can't keep some things open. And maybe we don't need to maintain 1,100 miles of trail on this unit. Um, and we have about 850,000 acres that that um, 1,100 miles is over. But others would say, well, maybe you only need 100 miles of trail. I don't think that's the right answer. Um, so you guys wanted other challenges. So this is me as a line officer. And when you become a line officer, folks would say, gosh, they might not know anything. Let's check with your fire folks and your wilderness folks. <clears throat> and that's really good because you got to know as a line officer, do you have the support of the folks that are on your unit working for you and championing the same things? Um, so I know several of you have vested in, in stuff with the WUFTAs program. Um, I get worried how much attention gets put on WUFTAs and how much time you want us to put in WUFTAs. And I want to just challenge you sometime to go back and look at what the WIFIT program that we used when we were doing that. As a line officer and helping WIFIT gave me a lot more easy tools and whatnot. So I'm just letting you know, this is just Deb talking of between the ease of use and who was using them and what the value was from it, WIFIT gave me a lot more benefit and stuff. And I'm still uncertain who's getting all the benefits out of WUFTAs, but I know it's not necessarily me in the decision making. But we're getting it in there. We're doing our best. But I'm going to tell you, I think that we could still do better with that one. Um, I think it's OK to say yes to fires, that we want to manage them. It's OK to say no, that there's going to be a su suppression component of it. But just because we're saying it might not be a fire that we necessarily wanted for the whole thing. We need to acknowledge right up front, we're still not going to be taking direct control actions on that whole fire. Mm -hmm. And if that means that we're just doing point protection like we were doing in the Bear Creek fire, that's OK. And we're still building that concurrent long-term plan with it. And folks are having a difficult time sometimes because we knew, and as it should be, whether we're having a fire in wilderness or outside wilderness, on this unit, we should be a lowest priority for resources coming or being ready for comparison with the WUI, you know, near Condon, Montana, near Columbia Falls, near Essex. But there still needs to be that balance of once we do have fires here, that we still need some support and being able to ask. And we are very fortunate to have a force that does support us and come. And pretty excited to see the fire representation from the park and across the forest and, and from Libby because we have asked and we do get folks here regularly. So I would say that's good. Um, and then I just say challenge you all to minimize when we're closing things. How can we keep things open for the public? We gain a lot more support from that when we have them open versus closed. Those are the lessons I've learned. I want to take a couple quick questions if anyone has them. and you know challenges specific to managing large fires on a district that has a lot of wilderness. And when we think about the national forest system, we have a lot of districts nationwide that don't have the kind of challenge that you have. You know, you're you're in the minority, I think, in terms of what you deal with here. So do you feel like you have a voice or a an avenue to influence policy or the national office or um, a way to, to be heard, or do you feel like you're just alone in the in the challenge? Um, I think Rick Connell, as our forest fire management officer, knows exactly what our needs are. Um, I think Frankie, sitting here, hearing and listening, is a great resource. But I do think we're the minority. I don't think folks know when our trailheads were closed here. For us to be trucking around and using access at Rocky Mountain District, so we're trucking six to seven hours with our stock program, having to secure hay when you've missed all your hiring deadlines, or not hiring, your purchasing deadlines. And then people are questioning in fire, well, don't you have hay already? Well, we don't have hay because um, it just got cut. <laughs> it just got cut, or you know, it wasn't even deliverable. And now we're trying to work out of um, Rocky Mountains Ranger District, and, and we add in our strings over there, um, and we're breaking down stock trucks. I mean, we worked out, we trucked for 
six weeks of not being able to have stock out of here. So then we're eating pasture down and we're needing to buy hay for animals and people are like, you don't need to feed your animals. If you're going to have a stock program, our stock program is going to support our fire program, we do need to buy hay. That shouldn't even be questioned. Um, and so those are the little things. Um, I think we're the minority. I think we're pretty good at sharing our rationale, but I don't think it necessarily it influences mm -hmm. policy. Other questions or comments? Uh, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, I saw so, so much incredible work that had been done, it looked like to me, in such a short period of time after those fires last year on the trails. Can you kind of, I, I know. Just, sure. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to hear that. That's phenomenal. So we um, followed, we did a lot of work under the P code on the fire in combination to some of the work under the H code under the burned area emergency. So we did both um, because you are allowed um, and worked with our ICs and fire management officer very closely to make sure that we weren't misusing any fire code. Um, but you know, when you do need to open up and get your access going back in your main routes and your public safety, you are allowed to be able to do some of the things like hazard trees and some of that. So we used a mix of funds to reopen trails last year. Um, and we're and now we're doing a mix of funds this summer with the continued work where we've got two construction camps going in there and then we've got MCC crews helping as well. I think it's important too. I think it was Matt or somebody said yesterday that, you know, when you guys were doing that work, it was fire people helping do trail work too and it was you guys bringing in crews from other districts to help out. And it's kind of, you know, a lot of people got involved in the trail work. Right, we put lead, trail leadership with the different crews, um, and then fire folks came. We had crew from Libby came. We had crew from the Gallatin come up. We had crew from Lincoln come up. We had folks from Hungry Horse and Tally Lake come in with some of our trail crews that were left. So we um, we had a large workforce stayed on into October. Again, there's some of those things that come back to get you. You know, most of those folks would have been laid off September 30th. So all of their lump sum leave and everything then comes out of their next fiscal year. Again, one more tap on your Wilderness Trails program that it was needed, so you do what's the right thing, but then you hurt yourself for the next fiscal year for your program. So those are the things from being integrated and thinking about it that our fiscal year stuff can hurt. And it, it not doesn't only the wilderness, uh, the wilder, wilderness and trails folks, but the fire folks that would have laid folks off September 30th also had their lump sum leave and coverage of our 1039 appointments have to be the next fiscal year. So it was all of us. So it's it's integrated. It's not one particular resource, um, but but we need to realize as fire seasons change and we're going to have longer seasons. And part of me laughs because as I came to the Flathead in 88, Red Bench was going on and, and we had a lot going on in the Kootenai when I left the Kootenai. We, we were used to long seasons um, of needing people to stay on, but then we get into these budget things of here's the thing and you know we're telling our folks right now, you're not going to be working after September 30th this year. Now that, that can change depending on what else we got going, but those are some of the factors we're dealing with. Deb, do you have the flexibility to use fire preparedness dollars to open up your trails that will be essential in managing future fires? We do have some flexibility to use some of the fire crew that are funded with fire preparedness as long as we've got some of the other things done and they're still available for that. Um, so yes and no, we still, I mean we have a pretty small fire crew here. Um, and if we were closer to, say, the shots and when they need extra work, but keeping them within their two-hour call, it doesn't necessarily work. But, but we have some opportunity there. Can you fund the portion of your trail crews with that? Um, we actually have some, we have about six folks on our trail crews right now that each have 10 days funded this year to help. And that was a big help. Um, basically, we added a person because we had some other base eight savings from things uh, so we're, we are very creative. <laughs> and I want to be careful how I answer that because Rick's standing in the back. <laughs> um, 
But yeah, we're creative and we run about 350 volunteers here. We have two Montana Conservation Corps crews. We have six um, SCA interns this season helping us. And, and those fundings came from grants that we competed for. With our, we work with four different racks from across this ranger district. So we, we, we go out, we seek a lot of outside funds to help us get the workforce that we have right now.